we're now going to uh, we're now going to look at uh, events in a bit more detail, hopefully, and give you a few ideas. So uh, just a quick introduction to Mike Hutton, who's on the screen. Uh, Mike was somebody that I met uh, probably 18 months, two years ago through Nottingham Rugby, where I used to work. Um, we did a couple of events together uh, and Mike's got a, a wealth of knowledge and experience of running events. So he'll share some thoughts uh, and some detail uh, with you shortly. Um, I won't steal his thunder so he can introduce himself a little bit more detail uh, and Tim Westwood that you've heard from so Tim's one of our club developers so Tim will be helping with some of the organisation as we go through this evening. Uh, quick housekeeping uh, before we go so please keep muted through the presentations at the end of Mike's presentation um, you'll have an opportunity to ask any questions if you've got any questions as you're going along and you want to put them in the chat feel free. Uh, and Tim will try and pick some of those out as we go through as well. Um, we will also have a question and answer at the end of both what I present and what Mike presents uh, as well. And then at the end of the session, Tim will just drop a uh, quick feedback form in uh, for the whole event. So again, if you could fill that in before you go, that'd be great. If anyone's got any questions at the end, then both Mike and myself will stay around um, so we can have a quick chat with anybody and then pick anything up after the session. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Mike. Thanks, Steve. Thanks very much. Uh, right, I'm Mike Hutton. I uh, work for a company called EMU Events. Uh, my background played rugby um, in the olden days uh, before professionalism. I uh, played with, the, with uh, several internationals and against many internationals. Uh, so being hit around, that's why my face looks like it does. Um, took early retirement. My knee went. Uh, which basically stuffed me um, and went through that uh, awful period of uh, feeling that the world owes me a living. Um, then, I, then I stumbled into events, running conferences and meetings, um, uh, started off at uh, a race school, uh, a car racing school, where I met a few uh, very interesting people, which I'll talk about in a little while, and then uh, been running my own company since 2006, where we're running um, uh, international uh, and UK based events uh, for people like Mars, Pepsi, um, uh, there's uh, Calvin Klein, Hugo Boss, Gucci, SnapWest, people like that. So uh, a few names that you may know, a lot of names that you won't know. Um, so my, what in business, the way I, I look at it is I'm, I'm always looking for opportunities to help people. I always feel that if, if you're uh, helping people, and networking with people, you'll get that return uh, to yourself later on in one way or another. Now, I've been involved uh, over the last few years helping uh, clubs of different sports um, to help either uh, get um, materials for the clubs or to help raise revenue for those. And that's where Steve asked me to come along and have a chat with you about it and, um, and see, see whether anything that I... Uh, I can impart will be useful for yourselves. So starting off my, my uh, leaving no stone unturned, basically you have lots of opportunities uh, within the club. You've got uh, lots of uh, think, uh, people who want to be involved in the club, look to them and, and use your database of contacts to discuss um, other opportunities. The next slide, please. Thanks, Steve. Right, so the big thing is, it's, it's all obvious, and a lot of this is really obvious, but um, the thing that I found when I've spoken to different clubs is they're not using it, uh, which amazes me. You've got within the club, you've got players, you've got people uh, in the background who help, you've got uh, family, friends, all of those are people that can get you business and increase your revenue. Now, that could be as basic as um, birthday parties, um, uh, children's parties, uh, adults' parties. Some areas we know you, you have this issue about sound at night, but there, there are ways around that. That's, that's quite an easy fix. Uh, and I've done that in a couple of occasions. So uh, if you want to talk about that any time, please feel free to give me a shout. Um, so within the club, you've got, uh, you've got your friends, you've got... 
um, the suppliers. So if you've got, I don't know, for example, um, a drink supplier, are you talking to them? Are you working with them and saying, have you thought about doing this? Have you thought about using our, our uh, uh, venue for whatever it may be? Beer festival is a big example. If you're not doing a beer festival and you're being supplied beer, which all, all clubs are, then you're missing the trick. Uh, these are the areas that you've got to be looking at. Um, local businesses, there's lots of local businesses. Unless you're right in the middle of nowhere, um, you will be allied to a, a town, city. Um, so you should be going to these local businesses and selling yourselves to them, even if it's uh, for example, I've, I've done it with one place where there were five directors of a company wanted to get away from the staff and have a conversation uh, privately. So we said, well, just use the clubhouse. Use the clubhouse. You've got it. It's yours. We'll supply you with coffee. We'll supply you with tea, biscuits. There you have to look at those local businesses. Is there a potential from those businesses for you to be able to uh, either get them as a supporter, get them involved uh, with the club or spending money with the club. Then you start to think, is it worth a punt and giving them that for free for the first day on the understanding that you may get it later? This is where you have to work together on your, yourselves and know your businesses. Who else is there? Think, think around the whole club, mother's clubs, children's clubs. Uh, a lot of the players, they've got young children or young wives. Uh, or partners and if you've got those then pull them in pull them in and and use them and they can they could be really helpful to you um one of the one of the people that i was uh, very um uh impressed with and uh, a, an amazing gentleman was a gentleman called jackie stewart who some people who, who are as old as i am will know jackie stewart and uh, next slide please steve um, now, Jackie, uh, he uh, was a Formula One champion. Um, he, uh, I, I had the um, pleasure and the honor of meeting him and his son. Now, uh, Sir Jackie Stewart, now, uh, I met him when I was in the racing game, um, working uh, on a team. Uh, he uh, is one of the best networking people that I've ever met. Uh, because with Jackie, what he does, and this is something that uh, I pass on to all of my clients, uh, and, and again, for all of the clubs, it's worth doing. If you've got Jackie Stewart, for example, he got Bollinger as one of his uh, sponsors. Uh, but what he did also do is then go to a glass manufacturer and say to this glass manufacturer, we want you to sponsor the club. If you uh, uh, sponsor the team, if you sponsor the team, we will put you in touch with Bollinger so that you then provide uh, Bollinger branded glasses. And they did, and they have, and they've done the same with beer. They've done it uh, with other products as well. So he, he brings them together, but not just that, he then got DHL involved. So DHL, and now um, when, the glass manufacturer Bollinger want to um, send products around the world, they're using DHL or the Lear Comp uh, Corporation for overseas travel. And so this is where he's really, really, really good and working those, those uh, networks. And again, a, a small one in the, in the corner about uh, him and uh, um, our friend um, who used to be the world champion, um, he, uh, he'll come back, but uh, Jackie Stewart was quite instrumental in, in his move forward. So next slide, please. One of the, one of the uh, things that, uh, again, a lot of companies have talked to me and said, well, how, where can we go? What, um, where can we get business? We haven't got time or this, that, and the other. Grab a calendar. Look at the calendar. And there was one I haven't put on here, but came up yesterday. Um, so look at every opportunity through the year. New Year's Day, why don't you do a, a breakfast after a New Year's breakfast for the people that uh, like sobering up breakfast 
or a lunchtime or a brunch so that they've got time to save it from the nights before. Chinese New Year, why are we not celebrating that? Let's do it. If you can do fireworks in your, in your venue, do it. Um, the other one that came up uh, yesterday was Beaujolais. Uh, if, you, if you've got anyone that's into wine and they do the Beaujolais run, it's always on the third uh, Thursday of November. Uh, but it starts at 12.05, I believe it is, in the morning uh, in France. And then there's the run across to the UK with the latest bottle of Beaujolais or case of Beaujolais. Why not do some sort of sponsor sponsorship um, and drawing people in to go, someone to collect, maybe do a, um, a, a raffle or a, 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 um, a plan to say, okay, who... Who, what, uh, how long will it take for them to get back from there to the club and, and then do a celebration when the person gets back? So you've got a long event. The longer you can stretch an event, the more money you're going to make out of it. And if you do that and then celebrate as the person arrives back into this con uh, to the club, uh, oh, they can open up the first bottle, you can get the press involved, they can see what you're doing uh, and, and uh, move it from there. So the next slide is to give you an example of something that I worked on actually with, uh, with Steve. Um, and this was actually the first non-chord music festival in the UK since lockdown. Now, we didn't shout about this at the time, we should have done, um, but this was using the, uh, the Nottingham Rugby Club, the, uh, the main pitch. And uh, we worked with a local gentleman who uh, brought in a band. Um, now this one, we, we had to think a little bit outside the box because it was, uh, uh, it was touch and go whether we could go ahead with it uh, and also um, how we could fund it without it actually costing the club any money. So what, we, what uh, Steve did, he pulled us in uh, we then went out and, and approached uh, universities who were doing event management courses. We, pulled, we managed to get the, the picture in the center is a team of volunteers that came from university who wanted to get something on their CV for event management. So we, we gave them a role on the event and they, they helped run the day, so, but they were free. That was the beauty of it. Uh, we didn't have to spend any money on it. The, um, the line marking was all done by the groundsman. The areas were marked out. Uh, the, the event was actually quite a successful event. Uh, the band were really good. Uh, we did have to get permission for music at that, uh, for that event. The one thing we were conscious of was making sure that the speakers were pointing away from the house because obviously it stops people having a good old moan at you. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one, of our, um, uh, one of the things we did there. Uh, we can talk a lot more on that, but obviously, uh, I just want to give you a feel for it. The next slide was, again, we took uh, a bit of inspiration from the vaccination um, world and COVID. Uh, there was a lockdown, but what we put together um, without, uh, without any charge, we used, again, uh, the club, um, we went to the local vaccination teams and we... Um, offered them a celebration party uh, to, uh, for all the effort that they'd uh, put together to vaccinate the nation. Uh, this was around 400 people. Um, we, put, uh, we got local sponsorship uh, to cover most of the event. Uh, some of the staff from the vaccination team got involved and they also provided various uh, uh, bits for the night as well. Uh, we got one of the... Um, one of the nurses, she uh, is actually a professional singer. So she sang on the night. Uh, we had another one who, <laughs> um, some people liked it, someone didn't, was a, blood, um, a red coat from Bufflings and he, he emceed the night. But it helped the night uh, tick over. Uh, they made, uh, a, well, we, we actually made a nice profit on that event. Uh, they went away happy and uh, and that one, again, we kept the noise down by keeping it all within the marquee that they were using. So next slide. Again, I can, I can go into more detail about this. Um, so utilizing your space is you've got, you've got a club 
uh, you'll all have a clubhouse, you'll all have the grounds to use. There are things like uh, women's institutes, uh, men's um, clubs, gardening clubs, horticulture, all sorts of things. They want to get together, especially nowadays. More and more people are looking for uh, somewhere to go for a coffee or something. Why not use your club for that? And that's being used in time when the club's not being used. During the day, in the clubhouse, during the week, perfect timing. Firework displays. Um, schools ptas i know some of you are already doing them but from what i've seen but schools and uh, uh do it so either link with the local school and say we'll do it from our clubhouse uh, from the ground or um take it on yourself and do it because a lot of them are backing off because of um needing certification certification is very easy to do your uh fireworks displays um one one other area I've been talking to a lot of first aid uh, trainers and they are struggling for venues and the cost for venues. What what would be worth doing is getting a link with your local um, uh, trainers and have a look at them, see how many people they can pull in. If they can pull in a regular group, then look at whether you say, OK, we'll charge you whatever, five pound a, a head or ten pound a head and we'll give them coffee, we'll give them biscuits. It doesn't cost you that much. It doesn't cost you that much to run it. And it's utilizing the venue that sat there during the day doing nothing. Uh, the other one on, on the bottom left hand of the picture is car parking. Some, some of the clubs are in a brilliant place near train stations or near towns or near a bus route. Why not use it uh, during the day and use it for car parking you can charge a fortune uh, or make a fortune just giving people parking and allowing them to go from your place into town. Uh, the, the other two are, are, I'll go over and I'm sure I'm, I'm not teaching you to suck eggs, some of you, but they, they, um, uh, there are clubs, uh, whether it be cricket clubs, football clubs, uh, or, um, or, or um, rugby clubs, you can, you can have um, get the people in for that as well. So get them get them linked in during the day, uh, and you'll you'll get a, a larger larger um, population. Good thing about getting the young people in for their their uh, activities is that you may get new followers into the uh, rugby club. So the next slide, please. Right, history repeats itself. That is all I've done with that one is really to say, um, look after um, your uh, clients when they come in. Uh, the amount of places I go to where they say, oh, right, you've got uh, that first aid training and there's 10 people in the room. You open the door, give them the coffee and walk away and they leave and that's it. You should be talking to them and, and uh, generating repeat business out of these people. The um, NHS, brilliant. They're looking for places to do training all the time and they're allowed to train. Hog roast, why not put a hog roast on? If there's anything going on outside the world, uh, there was, there was a, um, a guy that was traveling the country doing a cycle ride. Go looking to see where these are. Go on charity sites, go and see what's being planned and try and pull them through your club. If you can get them as a stop off at your club, it gets publicity for your club, it gets people coming into your club to clap them on. So that's something to look at. The one in the middle I put in, um, laser clays. There's nothing stopping you doing laser clays. It's quiet, it's easy, and it's e uh, easy to run. Talk to team building companies. They look for venues to work from, and they're desperate for places to work from. And if you can get a regular, if you can get a, a good rapport with them, they'll come back over and over again. So on to the last slide is basically there is treasure out there. You've just got to go looking for it. You've got to go digging for it. And it's talk to everyone and keep those people on your side. I've had a look around some of the clubs and some of the clubs, for example, Billingham Rugby Club. I don't know if you're in the room at the moment. The Billingham Rugby Club, if you're not doing it, why are you not talking to Billy Billingham from the SAS Who's There's Win? He should be 
on the club, past player, lifetime member, and get him in to speak, get him involved with the club. It's things like that. It's look at your look at who's local, who's a celebrity in the area, drag them in and make them a, a, a lifetime member. They'll they'll then love you and they'll get involved with you. Uh, that's a very, very short, brief overview of what I do, where you can get uh, revenue from. I'm here to talk to you. Can My email address is at the bottom. Uh, you can get hold of me anytime or through Steve, and we can discuss this and increase it even further. Thank you very Great. much Thank for your time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mike, for that. And uh, if there's any questions at this point, um, feel free to uh, sort of come off mute, Tim, if you could manage it and uh, just let Tim know that you've got a question, otherwise we'll move on. Yeah, there's nothing in the chat box at the moment. Okay, I'll move into this. Now, if we've got anything, we'll pick up with Mike uh, towards the end of the session. So a little bit of background about myself. I've uh, been involved with uh, Burton Rugby Club for a long time. Um, worked with also Barton Rugby Club over the last couple of years. So Burton are level five at the minute. Um, Barton uh, down at about level 10. Um, and I've also been Chief Operating Officer at Nottingham Rugby, where uh, when we moved ground out of Meadow Lane, which was a 23,000 really good capacity, brilliant facility, uh, we moved to our training ground, started to develop that. Uh, and took an events program from sort of a zero balance over a quarter of a million quid over a couple of years. Um, and that was built up around some of the stuff that Mike's talked about. Uh, and I'll outline some of the other uh, opportunities that I believe are out there for clubs to look at. So I think the first thing for me with events is, and Mike touched on this a little bit, is what is the event about? And as an organisation, um, and when we're looking at this, is it about servicing your current membership, bringing your members in, getting them more engaged with the club, doing different activities, different programmes? Is it potentially engaging with wider or new communities? Uh, and again, I'll uh, look at a couple of uh, really good and successful examples in a few minutes. And I know a lot of clubs have got those as well. Um, is it really about just breaking even? or are we trying to actually really generate income? And there's a real balance uh, as to how you do that, how you professionalize maybe some of the events and the bigger events that clubs run like open days or maybe fireworks nights and how those run to make it easier for yourselves as a club. Um, is it around raising the club's profile? Um, do you want more media? Do you want to be something? And, you know, as Mike says, getting a local celebrity down getting the club out there, showing people that the club's actually open to anybody. Is it about attracting new members, um, the rugby benefits? And again, you know, I, I sort of weigh this up and I have done in my professional capacity in the past is sometimes just doing something for the benefit of rugby is actually also uh, a great reason for doing an event. Sometimes that can uh, work and increase the income as well. Um, is it about increasing players or are we trying to uh, get a new target group into the club? It might be a school, it might be an area, it might be a group of schools, it might be three-year-old kids doing multi-sport activities. So it's really knowing what the event's about, what it's trying to achieve uh, and just making that open so that everybody that's involved knows what's going on. So moving on to this, for me, it's about a vision and a plan, not just for that small event which might be a friday night lights for eight group uh, eight teams of kids it's actually looking at the whole plan for the whole year and mike alluded to this and it was something i built and developed and i think it's one of those when you get a really good event and it works successfully and you can sort of start to develop that event um and i'll come on to one from burton rugby club in a little while where they did one this year worked really really well there's five or six things that they've looked at that can improve moving forward. And again, that will make the, the event bigger, better for everybody that comes in. Writing it down so you've got an annual plan. Um, and I used to also have a financial plan sat behind that at Nottingham where the bar income was in there, any secondary spend, any food was in there, uh, any event hire. So again, from um, someone... Uh, 
on a board level or in a committee, you're able to say, well, that's what the events have done. They were the outcomes. That's what's been achieved. Uh, and again, it shows how you can grow events and develop events over a period of time. Uh, Mike referred, one of the things I had at Nottingham was uh, lots of issues around loud noise and music. Um, so those types of events didn't really suit the club particularly well. So we had to look a little bit different and try and plan and develop those. And if we did do events where music was there, it was actually generating uh, really big events, going to the council, working in partnership with the council. So we actually had less issues in terms of uh, complaints and uh, local residents in that, which I know a lot of clubs would probably have similar uh, issues, particularly if you're in a housing uh, complex. And then going back to, again, what Mike said, how do you actually attract those events? So is there a funeral parlour that you can work with that actually the rugby club becomes a preferred provider of uh, the funeral parlour, weddings, uh, lots of different events that are out there. And people, as Mike says, are looking for those. For me, and again, it's about looking at trying to get more people involved. And I'll come on to the Burton uh, event in a little while that I'm going to sort of use as an example. But for me, one of the big things that Burton have done is actually created a uh, group. So they've got a group of 10 or 12 people who are involved in their commercial side of the club. So rather than it being one person, it's actually quite a good group of people. Um, and those people from within the club are from different backgrounds. So there's um, the guy that's leading it, uh, Matt Satchel, who unfortunately can't be with us, but he's got a group and some of them are partners of players. Some of them are parents and mini juniors. Um, they've got young ambassadors and uh, young people involved in the club as well. So again, involving more people, more hands make light work. And I think that is a really good successful model of where they've been able to delegate, get more people involved. And one of the things they have then done probably over the last six months is create a Facebook group where they've got over a hundred people who've accepted to help and volunteer with some events as they're going through. Now, they're obviously not going to help with everything, but it has sort of uh, created a, an army of people that are willing to do something. One of the things I think we sometimes forget as clubs, and certainly for me at Nottingham Rugby, this was probably one of the hardest areas. We spent a lot of time developing the event. We saw, um, set a lot of time up uh, improving what we did developing posters, leaflets, flyers, everything else. Um, what we weren't great at at one point was getting that to the end user. So I think it's actually looking at your plan, getting it written down. There might be 10 things devolving that so that you've got five or six people helping, making sure things get done and that there's one person in control that is sort of the mover shaker, trying to make things happen and appreciating that things will get dropped but if it's communicated well, we can pick that up. And again, with things like um, uh, WhatsApp, we're able to communicate quicker, more effectively than maybe getting lost in email trails. Um, so a few probably comments for me is using a marketing plan and using your events to maybe attract sponsors. And I used to call it free money. So at Nottingham, and I'll come on to a beer festival, but we used to have a headline sponsor that got a little bit of promotion, a little bit of publicity, but they paid a couple of grand. They got the logo on the glasses and we made you know, quite a bit of cash on the back of that just from them being a sponsor. And again, it was probably about 1,500 quids worth of free money in my eyes in that we didn't have to work very hard for it. They were a sponsor. They got their publicity and we went from there. Website, making sure the website's good quality. At the end of the day, people will go to the website. People will still look at websites how many clubs have got event sections on the websites? I don't know. But again, have a look at yours at your club. See what you're doing. See how you're promoting yourselves as a club. And that's a good takeaway. Um, using social media and regular posts. Um, again, I've been guilty of it. And I know lots of other people have is you put the posts out there. You leave it. You think it's done. And actually, it needs to go every week. It needs to go to different audiences needs to go out on different mediums of social media to make sure that you're engaging lots of different people. Um, getting your players and members to actually share your posts on probably Facebook and Twitter and things like that. So again, that reaches their audience and some of their audience so that you're extending uh, your involvement with different people. 
Um, if you haven't seen Hootsuite, um, I can't um, say how good this is for a club. So it's about 100 quid a year. Um, you're able to then schedule posts and it's the same post that would then go out through Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter. You can schedule it a week in advance. So it'll go out on a Friday night at six o'clock when everyone's looking for it. You can schedule posts and reschedule posts. So if you want to thank your sponsor uh, for your matches or your main club sponsors, you can do that on a weekly basis and that can go out. So again, creates less work for volunteers that are already uh, burdened. The targeted word of mouth, word of mouth, we all know how important that is, get people talking about it. Videos, again, will get probably somewhere in the region of four or five times more hits on Facebook and Instagram. So again, putting a little video, whether that's your head coach, whether it's one of your players, one of the kids, talking about an event that's coming up, that's very important as well. Looking at it as a campaign, do it for three months, do it for five months. If you've got a big event like fireworks night, that should be a 12 month campaign. Here's the next slot, here's what we're doing. Early bird discounts, we did that for the music festival that Mike discussed. So again, we drove early sales, which then meant three months out, we probably had just about covered the costs with the uh, guys that were organizing it. So we then knew that both ourselves and he was in profit. So anything else uh, was a bit of a bonus. Um, Inviting prospective sponsors, and I'll come on to this with the beer festival that I ran, but we used to invite all of the sponsors from both the club, any player sponsors, main sponsors, prospective sponsors that we wanted, networking groups. We used to invite them out down on a Friday night of the beer festival when we knew it would be a little bit quieter. We gave them sponsorship rights of the night of the networking, and then we were able to get 100, 200 people down to those events um, which again then increased our network, if you like, to then sell tables for hospitality and get them into sponsor a player or or whatever. It was usually low lying opportunities, but again, they're the good ones that are easy to pick up. Um, capturing data is key, and I know I talked about this at Nottingham a lot. Was when we were doing events, even if it was a free event was to try and use not a platform and there's you know various ones out there like uh, Ticketmaster, Eventbrite, Gigantic where they have those platforms some of them are free to use when you're not charging so again you can capture data of people attending and then utilize that data as a club to then send them invites for hospitality or VIP options again putting you at the front table on a sportsman sports dinner um, adding in bottles of wine, whatever it may be, again, enabled us to generate additional income from the people who were coming. And then the big thing for me is create demand, um, putting out there's only three tables left for hospitality next week. Again, it really pushes people to then join. Um, and one thing that I would say in terms of an event, Bournemouth Seven. So uh, I know the guy that set this up from scratch, it started off as a fairly small event. Um, it's now grown into one of the biggest sports events in the country. So again, I would say to people, follow Bournemouth Sevens on whether it's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and that will give you ideas of what they do throughout the year to help promote what they do. So again, looking at this, very simple, prepare as early as possible, months in advance, get a lot of stuff done. Um, on the sort of day of the event, looking at what your welcome area looks like. If it looks drab, dingy, horrible, unclean, people aren't gonna have a great first impression. And again, that was something uh, I felt quite important again at Nottingham when I was involved over there. Um, the delegation, the manage, the oversee, the support really is key in terms of just getting more people engaged. And I think Mike's comment earlier about People are willing. You've just got to go and have a chat with them. I think for me, if you send out blanket emails and blanket come and support us, it might have a trigger effect. But if you have a chat with somebody in the bar on a Saturday after a game or on a Sunday when they're watching their kids play rugby, they're more likely to get engaged with you if you ask them specifically to get involved. Leaders on events actually looking after smaller chunks. So again, as Mike alluded to with the music festival, you can imagine there was five or six major things, bar, which had trouble and issues on the night, pitch with markings, music area, all sorts of stuff. So 
again, having people responsible for each area made my job a little bit easier. So uh, I ended up on the bar most of the night helping out the bar staff. Um, briefing, communication and wrap up, you know, again, is really key to making sure that people know what they're doing on the day, communicating throughout and then having a wrap up at the end, which might be over a drink. It might be a week later. But again, not just letting that lie, because there's a lot of learning that happens on these events. Um, and then for me, celebrating and using it to generate new interest, you know, putting out videos of your amazing event that you've just had, the fireworks night, recording it and putting it out, say, come next year to our brilliant event on the 4th of November uh, or whatever it may be. So really, really positive stuff. So for me, uh, celebrate the success internally, making sure that all the volunteers in making sure they feel that their contribution has been really successful. Tell everyone about your brilliant event. And as I said before, save the date for next year, put it in, plan early. One of the biggest failings I probably had initially at Nottingham was we had no real plan. We were going hand to mouth and it was very much, we were pulling an event in a month before and trying to make it work. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Debriefing internally, again, being open and honest. If something didn't work, talk about it. How can we do it? Or do we just get rid of it? Um, seeking external feedback, asking open questions to people who are there, maybe chatting to a few people that you've seen there that you know you can trust. Um, what can be done better next time? Um, and the big one I always used to sort of chat with the staff at Nottingham was, did we leave money out there? Now, certainly at big events we have done, we've had varsity events where if we'd have had another three bars, We'd have made another 10 grand, five grand, whatever it may have been. So we'd again review that, look at what we could and couldn't do the following year, and then hopefully grow each event as we went through. Review, was the event worth it? You know, one of the big things I'd say to lots of rugby clubs is, was it worth it financially? Was it worth it to your membership? Or did it have a third impact, which might be new people at the club? If it isn't, probably not worth doing. And we sometimes just do what we've done because it's the right thing to do or we think it's the right thing to do. Sometimes it's just a matter of uh, stopping and restarting, doing something different. Financial review, making sure it's recorded. I said earlier, it's really key. And for me, presenting that to my board was great because I could send it out beforehand, show them what we'd made, show them what we'd taken, and then we could have a discussion around it. Uh, and a full review and start planning for next year. You know, As soon as the season was finished, looking at the 10 events that really work, the club organised, and then look at other partners that could come in. So we had an events company that used to run Sportsman's Dinners, um, and they'd run three or four a year. So they could then fit around our fixtures, around our programmes and what, whatever we had in there. So just a couple of quick examples, uh, and I've spoken a little bit around this in terms of, we had a 40 metre marquee at Nottingham. Um, so we had a a headline sponsor which came in they got a bit of publicity we made some money we then sold the barrels so we had sponsors a uh, 100 quid plus fat for the barrels which covered the cost of the beer so before we opened the door we'd already made two or three grand profit and all the beer for us was free when we sold it to the uh, punters we did it as a beer festival in year one we then did beer in prosecco we then did beer prosecco gin and as you can see it's sort of grown and developed from there um volunteers as you can see in the middle the guys with the uh, dodgy orange wigs that call themselves the flameheads um they came in they ran the bar for us for free we gave them a few beers at the end obviously and it was great having you know people that were different to the club that weren't necessarily the normal volunteers got heavily involved and supported us um year two we then created a festival of rugby around it we did it around the six nations uh, super saturday so Saturday, three Six Nations events worked really, really well. Friday night, we then did a kids uh, festival, which started, I think, about under nines. We then did under tens the following year. And then that developed to about under 13 when uh, COVID hit. That's restarted now at the club. And again, on the Friday night, that brought in 16 kids teams. So somewhere in the region, about 250 players. That brought a couple of people with each player at least. So again, there was probably 750 people drinking, eating, and then we had the sponsors night. So they saw a really vibrant club when they came down. So on the Friday, we probably had about 1,250 people in there at different times. We also did a student's game. 
Uh, and then we also then had uh, the local clubs having their round robins on the Sunday. So we had a Friday, Saturday, Sunday event around rugby, but also linking to a beer festival. Um, said about the networking and the university stuff. Another thing, again, that we did that just as ideas that were really good. Uh, we play most of our kids rugby across the country on a Sunday. Um, we then set up some Friday nights on our main pitch and a second floodlit pitch uh, for the local uh, team. So we had uh, some girls nights, we had mini and juniors nights, touch rugby, Colts. We had a business night with a local company. And again, we tried to just generate Friday night lights, bit of fun. We had to do it in September and October and March through to May because of the pitch getting uh, ruined if we did it outside of those windows. But we probably did four or five of those over the course of the year. Each one of those probably took somewhere in the region of two grand. Um, so again, it was a great opportunity to just develop new events, new income uh, and go from there. And we also had student nights. So looking at the local universities and they'd have uh, social games. So sometimes it might be IMS rugby, the intramural rugby, uh, but that we'd put them on the main pitch and let them play on the main pitch under floodlights. And that obviously created secondary spend. Um, I mentioned this a couple of times um, as I've gone through. So uh, this was an event that I was uh, very impressed with. I think Martin Evans from the clubs online at the minute. Um, and it was something that Burton did when they moved to their new ground um, in September. Um, last year so they had a big group of people um developed the event um and over four thousand people attended and uh, matt satchel was going to be on tonight who was one of the guys instrumental to it um but i sort of asked him a lot of questions around why so many people attended um and a lot of it was around there was lots of opportunities so there's bouncy castles there was food and craft stalls um, so each food and craft stall had its own following on its Facebook and Twitter. So again, they promoted themselves as they pushed uh, the event out to try and get people in for their stall specifically. Um, they drip fed the stalls out that were coming. Uh, there was a band pre-game, which was exceptional, had a lot of people there, a lot of good vibe around it. And if I'd have thought about doing that, I'd have probably done the band post-game. Uh, did it pre-game, people were there, they then watched the first team game uh, and I think their opponents, which um, I think was Sheffield, were quite surprised when they turned up and half of Burton was there uh, for an open day. Um, the promotion, there was lots of regular social media promotion and I saw it as sort of a club member as such coming regularly out there on Facebook and Twitter and, uh, and everything they did, so that was really positive. Um, there was a 10,000 leaflet drop um, that went out into targeted areas of the town, targeted estates. There's a new estate around the club, so that was a priority. Um, but then also other local areas. And you know, I got one in at my house at home and was quite pleasantly surprised living four or five miles away that they'd actually made the effort uh, to promote the programme and the day out there. Um, day of activities for me sort of started around 12 noon and then it was after the first team game and lots of people were still there. It was a lovely day, nice weather, so obviously that helped. And then an additional bar, and again, talking to Matt, part of their learnings were the, uh, the average gate was possibly higher um, as they moved there. There was a new ground, so it's hard to tell the why. But again, I, I've spoken to people down at the club who've never been to the rugby club before because they went to that event. They've gone down relatively regularly. Um, I've chatted with Matt about looking at using a ticketing system for next year. So a lot of it can be online and uh, creating that data. Um, music potentially on longer for next season. So again, going back to Mike's comment, keeps people around for longer. Um, the numbers were really, really high. Again, the bar offer and the cash left there, although the club did really well on the day, could have made a lot more money if there was another three bars. But again, they weren't to know that they were going to get that number of people. And then volunteers, uh, Facebook group that I remember be, uh, mentioned before, it might be a great thing for clubs to do. Again, you can communicate really quickly. They've done things like we're putting up a new, uh, new uh, school board. Can anyone help us? They've had two or three people say they'll go and help. So again, it's another mechanism of getting volunteers to do little jobs at the club that all add up to uh, big opportunities. So thanks for listening. Hopefully um, there's a few questions or things that people want to ask. So, 
Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. And then if anyone's got any questions or we've had questions, please uh, let Tim know. Well, Tim, have you got any? Yeah, hi Steve. Um, yeah, some some good questions in the in the chat. So if we start, uh, Ken Davis was asking, in your experience, Mike, what were the biggest earners in terms of events uh, that you organised? Uh, events where I could I can put them into a rugby uh, scenario, a rugby ground. Um, actually, the beer festival is a huge earner because basically there's no no outlay. Uh, if you can get everything sponsored and covered, uh, then there's no outlay to you at all. And you're getting a long, a, a huge revenue income uh, from that. That's that's a massive one. Another one that I've, I have done that, again, works really well, and this is for the, uh, for the, the people to go looking, uh, is to go to the network marketing companies uh, like Herbalife, Amway, Avon, people like that. They tend to hold huge events, huge, like they can have it from uh, their local uh, representative where they'll maybe pull in 50, 100 people. Um, and they're basically all they're doing is hammering away at their product and uh, brainwashing people into uh, selling their product. But it works. And um, I've done events for up to 5,000 people for Herbal Life. And uh, the beauty there is, if you do it the right time of year, you can do it outside. You can do it in uh, at the um, around the ground of the club um, regularly. Six hundred people meetings, uh, and uh, with uh, say, for example, Nottingham Rugby Club, where uh, Steve was from, uh, you can get just about four hundred people in there uh, to to uh, um, to one of these meetings. These tend to be monthly or, or every two or three months so they're regular regular income and you those again i i tend to uh with with those i tend to try and get the venue at a lower cost uh, and but then for the venue you're making all the money on the drinks and everything that people are buying at the at the uh, event so um the, those two are my big earners the sort of the beer gin vodka festivals Vodka's becoming a biggie now, but those huge uh, money earners with very little outcome. The conference element of it, so long as you've got a good AV uh, supplier and um, putting the, the kit in, but normally people like Herbal Life will bring all their own kit in. And so you can then, you're making money without having to put any money out. Perfect. That's great. Thanks, Mike. Steve, have you got any to, any to sort of add to that? Um, yes, again, certainly the beer festival. Uh, is pretty good. Um, putting in craft beers, the gins, everything around that's great. I think for me, using what you've currently got, and I learned with the Friday Night Lights program that we did with the kids, particularly actually opening up, letting the kids come and play on the first team pitch, getting them fully engaged in the club as such. We used our amateur club to then contact the six or seven local clubs. They came in, they're on the main pitch, didn't do any damage to it. Uh, and again, doing it at the right times of years, it's warmer, the parents stay a little bit longer, they drink in the bars. Uh, I think that's, you know, really positive. And then, you know, it's the obvious big ones like the fireworks nights. But I used to, you know, again, chat to the sort of staff at Nottingham and it'd be very much around make the big bigger. So I think rather than try and do lots more events and try and yeah, get more volunteers to do more events. Sometimes it's around looking at the ones that you do as a club really well and putting another bar in, does that make you an extra grand? It can be as simple as something like that to sit back and just reflect on what you actually do like that. Yeah, no, perfect. And I think from my point of view, just to add to that, as a club developer, we, we deal with clubs and, and work with clubs really closely. The other element to that Friday Night Lights is that it, it, if you do it with adult players it gives them their weekend back so actually we're in a time where we know that the adult male game is is sort of um has been struggling a little bit for numbers but actually you might find that your availability not always but it might find that availability goes up on a friday night and you'll turn 
my old team who I used to coach level seven, uh, one man and his dog watching on a Saturday to three or 400 people all buying beer and having a more of a party atmosphere on a Friday night lights. So yeah, I think there's, there's so much to Friday night lights, not just the business side of it, but also the rugby development side and, and getting people to play, but also giving them, giving them that weekend back where they, they then, you know, might not have been available on Saturday. So I just add that to there as well. Brilliant. Um, Ken, you asked another one. So I'll come to you again. Um, and you were asking about how do you manage your GDPR when using people's data from other sites? And you sort of clarified that by saying it's not so much the, the data of members that you collect, but if you data collect from social media, for instance, so Twitter, Instagram. So how do we how do we manage that GDPR? And um, either Mike or Steve want to pick up on that. Uh, I've found I, I don't basically. Uh, otherwise, you get shot in the foot by somebody uh, who, uh, who's got nothing else to do in their life apart from pick on you. Um, it's, I tend not to. What I do is I'll get into social groups and get those social groups. And the big thing is if you can follow people and get them to follow you back, then, then you can start to get them to do the, uh, the advertising for you rather than you doing it. So they're going out to their followers. So that's that's the way to do it. Is I, I wouldn't go trying to pin, uh, drag things in from people uh, uh, where where I can't where I shouldn't be contacting them. I use my existing contacts to use their contacts. It's the old thing of uh, uh, every one person you talk to has got another ten or twenty or hundred people that they talk to, and that's the way I would do it. I I wouldn't. GDPR is is a minefield. Yeah, I think just to add to that, from a you know social media point of view, uh, it's exactly as Mike says. It's getting as many people to share what you're doing, and if other people see that, then you know that's part of Facebook platform or whatever it may be. Um, I certainly found LinkedIn was very useful for that from a Nottingham rugby. Uh, club account so people in Nottingham would then follow it and get involved in it and uh, add over I think 2,000 followers at one point with that which again spread the word particularly hospitality wise um, and then in terms of if you're running events and using a ticketing platform they have a GDPR process within there so again we used to use Eventbrite quite a lot and also Gigantic and within there uh, whether it's one any of those bigger platforms, they have the ability that they can use the data if you your participants sign up to it and Nottingham Rugby or whoever it may be as the club can also do it. And again, they would sign a box to say, we consent to uh, receiving information from Nottingham Rugby. And then we used to download that into our rugby mailing list. Uh, and again, we had, we had a sort of system around that, but you know that that in its essence is is the basis we are going to come in dave as well no i was just i was going to say i thought i thought the question was more related to uh the use of that ticketing like an event price because we use event price and, it, and it's and, and it follows the same principle that you you give data for a specific event but you can ask that question in terms of whether you want to receive anything else in relation to the club you know and then you follow the normal rules but yeah I, that that was all i was wanting to say Perfect. That's great. Thanks, guys. Um, so, Alan, uh, coming to yourself, Alan Hill, um, you said you partially answered my question, but how did you identify people to organise events? I'm sure we have many talented people among our members, but we seem to struggle to identify them. So uh, how would we uh, how, how are we sort of identifying people, uh, volunteers to, to run these events, either either Steve or, uh, or Mike? Um, I think for me, and I'll, I'll go first, um, it's actually asking around and speaking to people. Um, and just doing a bit of digging and it might be five, six of you within the club just say, right, next Saturday, next Sunday, we're going to go around, have a chat with people, find out what's going on and ask the question. Um, Mike, believe it or not, came through a contact at the club initially and helped and volunteered on that music event. Um, and that was the first time I met Mike, who'd been involved with the club for years. Um, so sometimes it's just a matter of opening those discussions and having a chat. And, I, and again, I'll go back to the Burton sort of thing. And I know Martin's on uh, here, but sort of with the Burton uh, 
stuff that they've done at the minute. They've just asked the question. They've spread the net really wide. They've got young ambassadors involved. So I think there's about 30 uh, young ambassadors at the club now. Um, they get involved usually by doing coaching or refereeing initially, but then they've been helping on car parking. They've been helping signpost people around the club for events. They're involved on a match day, serving food to people in hospitality. So I think it's just having a bit of a plan in the club and just asking as many people as you can. Um, and it's it's funny when you when you open those discussions and have a chat. Yeah, I met a CEO of uh, quite a decent sized uh, business um, who's involved in marketing and promotion, who's involved with Burton Rugby Club in the week. Um, and now that skill set's there. It's a matter of trying to tap into it as much as possible. Just ask the question regularly. I agree. I agree with you totally, Steve. It's uh, it's the big thing. It's opening your mouth and talking to people. And everyone likes to have a drink over beer. And I think that that is huge. The only other thing I'd add to that is a, um, a membership audit. So uh, part of your, you'll have hundreds potentially of, of mini and junior parents and who knows what a lot of them do what they specialize in during the week and what they work in and you, you've probably got all of the talent and all of the people there that you need to to run these great events and if we just ask people to volunteer we ask them well what am I volunteering for well just to volunteer for rugby whereas if we ask them to volunteer specifically for something that we're trying to do based on the fact that we know what they do because we've asked them on the membership form or something else then I think that's another certainly something I've seen in clubs uh, used positively so so don't forget to you know try and find out in any way you can what your what your club members and their parents what they actually do outside of rugby because that that could really help you with this one thing to add to that um uh, which is a great point a really good point but one thing to add to that which very very few companies i know do is when people give you their email address when they sign up for membership look at the company that they're linked to not all of them are on gmail or hotmail or whatever some of them have their company name on there. And if it's a company name, then go and research that company. Go and have a look at who that company is and what they do. And that person may only be, maybe, I don't know, a cleaner or something like that. But who knows who they know within the company that might be able to help you on that uh, in that area? No, yeah, definitely. Thanks, Mike. Just, and just, one, just one on that, Tim, as well. Um, and Mike's just sort of triggered my memory on it is we actually invited all of our mini junior coaches and team managers and anybody that was involved in running any of the mini juniors down to the beer festival that we ran, gave them a free drink and a couple of halves, uh, a free glass and a couple of halves. We got them down and again, it was just really to try and see if there was any other sponsors in there that might be interested, but also, you know, plumbers, solicitors, lawyers that might help the club at another event as well. No, brilliant. That, that's really good. Um, that was most of the questions. There was one. There was one more that I picked up on, and I sort of had a, a brief chat in the in the chat box with Mark. Um, so, Mark Hennessy's just said that film nights are also very good. And I don't think we might we might have covered them sort of briefly in in your presentations. But um, Mark's uh, Mark, if you wouldn't mind coming off mute and just telling us what club you're from and and your experience of those, just briefly, that'd be really appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, no worries whatsoever. Um... I'm actually in Ireland, so if the um, if if the signal drops, I apologise. <laughs> um, I kind of sit across two clubs where my kids go to one, go to Warsaw, um, and I um, play very badly at Visions uh, Rugby Club in um, as sort of streetly sort of Caulfield way, um, but. Uh, at both clubs, we've done um, film nights where we found uh, a local guy that's got all the kit um, and basically gone in on a 50-50 basis, so a risk and reward, and that worked very well. Um, and specifically targeting the mums of the clubs and the friends of the mums on the clubs so, you know, we've done things like Mamma Mia, which actually did one on Friday, just gone at Visions. Um, and there was upwards of 600 odd people there. And I would say about 400 of them were mums just out for a good night. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's things like that. It's using the club's facilities um, to actually put these events on. And then, you know, within there, the 
we sat down directly afterwards and identified areas where we'd missed tricks, like putting things up um, in intervals of the kids playing, having fun and enjoying themselves, you know, to try and invite more people in. But it was very much a community-based thing as well. So uh, it pushes the club out further and further. And then, and we replicate that down at Warsaw. Um, and you know, we're, we're looking at targeting um, the local area with different films that would suit the local area and bring people in. No, that's brilliant. Thanks, Mark. Really, really useful. No and I, I'm just looking as well. I'm just going to put a link in the chat in a second um, with uh, to, to the... Um, the YouTube channel that we run for, for RFU club support. Uh, and there's some really good ones on there as well, but Otley in particular, Otley RFC up in Yorkshire have, um, have done some great stuff around volunteer recruitment by having a vision and having a, a, a club plan. Um, and it's definitely something that I sort of hold up and, and, and show to sort of, or help other clubs with and say, look, it's worth looking at this because of the, the, the they, they got 50 new volunteers by having, having this sort of formalized plan in place because people knew what they were buying into, knew what they were volu volunteering for. It wasn't just volunteering for rugby. It was volunteering for a certain certain point, and it, it was very very successful. So I'm going to pop that into the um, into the chat in a, in a moment. Um, has anyone else got any any more questions? If anyone else has got any more questions, please, there's, it was not a big number of us, so please feel free to just pop off mute and, and ask any questions now. We'll give you sort of thirty seconds or so, and, and if not, then um, then Steve will start to start to wrap up. And what I'll do as well is I'm just going to post that YouTube link, but I'm also going to post a feedback. This is very new to us, this system and, and uh, Zoom events. So we really would value your feedback, please, on, on this evening's session, both with Lance and then and then in this session with us. So if you can, please just take a couple of minutes just to click on that link and, and fill that out. We really would appreciate it. So I'll, I'll pop those in. But if anyone's got any more questions, please do um, please do come off mute and ask them now. All right. Do you mind if I just say two more things, if that's OK? Um, Go for it, Mark. No, thanks. Um, number one is don't forget to thank the volunteers mm. as a club the more you thank the volunteers the more they'll do for you and i think at times that gets missed and also the last one is don't be afraid to share share what works for you with other clubs because we're all in it together at the end of the day and you've got a different catchment area yeah no nah, great point uh, two great points thank you mark really appreciate that Good man. Um, so anyway, if anyone's got any more questions, please feel free. Um, but at this point, I'll, I'll hand back over to Steve. And if, if there's no more questions, then then uh, Steve, back to you. Thanks, Tim. Um, thanks massively to uh, Mike and Tim for helping out tonight and uh, Mike coming on and sharing what I know is a massive amount of knowledge and wisdom uh, in amongst those having worked with him quite a lot. So again, as Mike said, if you've got any ideas, thoughts, you want to chat with him, he's, he's welcome to having those discussions uh, sort of separately at a later time. Um, for me, it, it's just about a matter of having a plan for your events. Um, you'll get the slides afterwards, uh, which hopefully will trigger some ideas. Uh, again, if, if you want to contact me individually and have a discussion or uh, set up another discussion with the club afterwards, then I'm more than willing to do that and throw ideas around. Um, and uh, at the end of the slides, I didn't go into another four or five slides, but I've done almost like a tick sheet that I used to use again when we were running events with various people, sometimes students helping us. So again, that will come out, which is almost like a tick sheet to say, have you done this? Have you done that? So again, that will come as part of the slides. But thank you very much for your time tonight. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, see you again soon. Welcome, welcome tonight. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, if you can't, please check your connection. You're on the using social media to engage players webinar. We really appreciate you. Somebody's on the uh, YouTube channel and clicked on a thing. That's what you can hear. That's a good old dulcet tones of Ian Renard on a on a on a recording. So I'm not quite sure. Oh, Excellent. It, it was Ian, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's used the YouTube link I sent that, so that's good anyway. Shows it works. <laughs> yeah.